My name is Malcolm Sharp uh, from Curry Twisted Sticks. Welcome to the International Association of Woodcarvers. All right, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to the International Association of Woodcarvers. Uh, today is August the 20th. We're in our summer series. I uh, appreciate everybody taking time out to join us today. I hope everybody's having a good summer. Um, Want to let everybody know this will be our last summer series meeting uh, starting in September. We're going to try to go back to a weekly format uh, starting with September the 3rd. Uh, we're going to try to have weekly meetings like we were doing in the spring. So look forward to getting back into doing a weekly thing. Uh, we'll make sure we stay, uh, uh, keep everybody up to date on social media as far as uh, when we're meeting and who we're meeting with. Uh, again, we meet uh, on Saturdays, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We always use the same Zoom meeting number. Uh, so when you get a chance, join us again, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, today, I wanted to let you know we have uh, Malcolm Sharp on with us from Tacoa, Georgia. He's going to be coming on and talking to us about uh, his twisted sticks that he carves uh, from Curahi Twisted Sticks. And I'm sure I slaughtered the name. Uh, he'll come on and tell us the right way to pronounce it here in a second. Uh, before I get started with him, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we've got coming up. Um, there are some workshops available out on Wood Carving Academy. Make sure you check out there uh, and see the workshops that are coming up for you to uh, participate in. Uh, September the 30th, Janet Cordell has a uh, workshop on carving female faces in cottonwood bark. Um, on October the 1st, Dave Stetson, who's with us today, is going to be uh, doing a class on the seated reader. Uh, on October the 8th, Kevin Applegate is going to be doing The Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, November the 5th, Dave Stetson is going to also do a class on Carving Santa. And on December the 3rd, Bob Hershey, who is with us today, uh, is going to be doing a Raccoon Santa. So make sure if you're interested in those, uh, touch base with these guys, get out there, get signed up. Uh, some of them may have uh, rough outs that you'll need to purchase, so you'll need to contact them and find out what you need. Uh, but they'll be excited to have you in the class and uh, – from experience, I can tell you, you can gain a lot of information from these classes, so make sure you try to go out and sign up for those. I uh, just want to remind you, all of our videos through the International Association of Woodcarvers are out on YouTube. We'll be posting this one out there either later tonight or tomorrow. Um, if you want to support us, again, we're having to pay for the Zoom subscriptions. Uh, I'm going to put a link in the, uh, in the chat after I get finished here of our link tree. You can go out and buy me a coffee, which will go to support these meetings. Uh, we're also going to be doing a, um, um, a healthy knife auction coming up uh, at the beginning of September. The proceeds to that uh, will go towards these uh, Zoom meetings as well. So make sure you participate in those things if you can. Um, having said all of that, uh, we're happy to have Malcolm on. Uh, Malcolm's going to be discussing with us his process, his carving journey, uh, and how he makes the, uh, the twisted six sticks. Uh, so, Malcolm, we appreciate you taking time out with us today, and I'm going to go ahead and turn the meeting over to you and uh, let you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you do. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me say thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an honor. Um, so I carved these uh, snakes on sticks, walking sticks, canes, uh, hiking sticks. I guess a little bit of history. A lot of people want to know how I got into this. And... One of the main questions I get asked is why snakes? And the answer to that is because sticks don't grow looking like rabbits or elephants. So it looks like a snake. Um, I don't love snakes. A lot of people think I, I, I do. I love the patterns. I love the, the, the natural camouflage, where they can blend in. I've always been fascinated by that. Uh, but the way I began was I was hunting one day and I come across a, a, tw a twisted, naturally twisted tree that I thought was a snake and it scared me. And of course, I looked at it for about a week and I kept thinking, you know, I should cut that down and try to carve it. But I had never carved anything. I didn't know anything about carving. I'd always been artistic. Uh, I like to draw a lot. and I've done a little clay work, uh, some painting. But finally, one day my wife was with me. She saw it. And she encouraged me. She said, you should cut that down. And, and I did. And I carved it, and everyone that saw it, you know, they they, uh, they were impressed by it. And, and I started having people, you know, all the friends, you know, make me one, make me one. So um, at first, it was just a hobby uh, and, you know, something I enjoyed doing. But it turned out I had worked for a company for almost 20 years, and I was starting to have a lot of uh, leg pain and back pain. And it, it got to where it was hard to stand up for very long. And it turned out I was born with a, a tethered spinal cord. 
and it caused me to have some issues. I have, you know, real shaky hands from it. Um, I use a lot of wood stains in my work because, you know, painting with a brush is hard to do if your hands are, are, are shaky. Uh, but it, it got to the point that it was so bad that when I get off, I really couldn't do anything. Uh, I could, but it, it just caused more pain. So I, I spent a lot of time sitting around carving sticks. And eventually it got so bad that I, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it no more. So I had to quit. But I was fortunate in that I already had this hobby and it was growing. You know, I picked up a few customers by then and, and I decided to try to just do it full time. You know, uh, I started going to different art shows and art venues and, and uh, won a few ribbons and things like that and found a few collectors, people that, that, that were really interested in my work. Um, since then, it's only grew. Um, you know, it's something I really enjoy doing. Uh, you know, I, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not real fond of, of live snakes. So, you know, Batman used his biggest fear to help fight crime, and I've used my biggest fear to help, help me make a living. The, uh, it was interesting when I first got married, for about the first year there, with my wife's foot touched my foot, I would wake up and little like screaming snake in the bed. Uh, this has been a great uh, relief of that carbon, studying the different snakes, studying the species that are venomous versus non venomous. And so today my phobia is not nearly what it was. I still don't want to be around a, a line of snakes. I don't know, maybe the, uh, the pythons and things like that, they don't scare me so bad. They're like the uh, but I'm going to try to explain to you today what I do, how to do it. There are two different methods. One is a nat carbon from a naturally twisted tree. I'll show you in just a second what that looks like. So here's one. This is a naturally twisted tree. And essentially what happens when it's a sapling, a vine will wrap around the tree in a spiral. And as the tree grows, it causes the wood to bulge. Um, this is the traditional folk art way of carving these sticks. Um, I kind of prefer it because Mother Nature has a hand in how the snake is going to land on the stick. This is what I saw that when I was hunting that time. That, you know, I thought it was a snake wrapped around a tree. Um, but it's you can do this if your if your preferred method of carving is like traditional uh, with knives and gouges. You don't need any power tools to do it. You're using from a naturally twisted tree. There's a lot of work Mother Nature's already done for you. Um, I prefer to carve larger twisted trees because it gives you the ability to take the snake down more and get more of a, uh, a rounded look. Um, but to start with, when you cut one down, always cut it um, at least a few foot longer than you want it to be. Because as it dries, it's going to want to tend to split on the ends. Uh, I Normally, I let mine dry with the bark on. Um, Save the ends though, when you when you go to start on it, I'll show you why here in a little bit. But when you when you cut it to the right length, save those end pieces and when the star drying goes, you know, you need to let it probably at least about a year, eight months to a year and a half, depending on the size. Now, if you have a way to dry on, you know, it might help make it quicker. You, know, you can do that. Um, I've heard, you know, a lot of times you can put them like you got an old car or something in the summertime. And just roll the windows up. Uh, you know, someone that's got like a, a sawmill or lumber company, they, oftentimes they have the ability to heat green. But you want to let it dry for at least a year because if you try to carve one green, it's going to want to split on you more. Um, there's, you can, if you wanted to just do it natural carving with no power tools, of course, you can just use any kind of knife, take the, the, the bark off. Now, there is a, a a man by the name of David Steely, and I believe he's passed away now, but he has a, a website, and I'll send those link, links to Blake so you guys can, can check it out. It's artsticks.com. He was a fantastic snake stick card. He won a lot of awards, um, and his methods was all by hand, no power tool. And he has a tutorial on his website that shows you how to carve these uh, step by step, uh, different tools he uses, gouges and things like that. And, and I'm gonna go into also the uh, power carving side of this thing. 
Um, one thing I was going to show this. Well, I'll show that in a minute. But one thing I would say, a tip, is when you're carving these, find the head. Now, I, don't, I guess I can, I can see this, but this is my my first choice, or this is my first choice for a head. But I can also make a head here, and I wanted to tell this first so I didn't forget it. Sometimes you may not be able to have enough from the very end of these to get a head. So, but I'm going to try to get the head here first instead of just go ahead and, and carving that off. But if this fails, then I've got actually more meat here. So as I'm taking this down, I'm not. This is going to be. I'm not going to do this neck area until after I've got my head, and I know my head's going to work out. But so essentially, you can you can take it down, take the bark off. I I tend to now do more power carving. I started out with uh, this knife work, and it takes a really long time. It still takes a while, um, depending on the size of the, uh, the snake, the species, and the pattern. It can take anywhere from three weeks to three months on some of the larger ones, and that's even with the power farm. Um, but, and a lot of times when people ask me, you know, well, do you do the stick first or the snake? And the answer to that is you kind of want to work them at the same time. You're going to have to, you know, depending on how big around you're going to want the shaft of the wood. But one thing you don't want to do is finish the snake before you finish the shaft completely, because if you have to go back and do any sanding, then you're probably going to end up taking off a lot of your scale work. So once you've got the stick itself skint and you've got the shaft down to the size you want it, go ahead and do your finish work on your shaft before you start doing your scale work on your body. That way you don't you don't you know destroy any scale work you do on your when you're sanding. Um, using your uh, gouges to do this, of course, you're going to want to do stop cuts, but be sure you don't go so deep that you're actually carving into your, your shaft. And one way to finish up your shaft, what I like to do, if I have it in here, you can, and there's all sorts of things you can do, but you can take a piece of tape, and this is just like Gorilla Tape, works really well, put sandpaper on it, and then kind of work in between that to kind of clean it up real good. If you're working with um, hand tools only, you are definitely going to need a way to hold these. Uh, you've seen the horses, a lot of people use those. Uh, what I've done is made like a, a, a wooden sawhorse. The stick sets in and it's got a ratchet strap that I can bring over and tighten it down and it holds it real firm and I can loosen it, turn it however I need to. But you're definitely going to need a way to hold them, if you're, especially if you're using, you know, your hand tools, or hammers and things like that. Uh, once you get the, the, the shaft to the size you want it and you've got the snake completely uh, shaped out like you want it, then you can start um, working your, your uh, scales and your head plates and things like that. I guess let me show you. I'll show you. So essentially, before you get the to the scale work on the head, you're going to want to get the the shape of the head, right? So that's a lot of sanding involved in that, um, as well as you know carving. But once you do, if you'll study a snake's head, or, or uh, I don't suggest you go get a real one, but you can't go to. But look at I've looked at a lot of pictures, and each snake has different different types of scales. There's keeled scales, there's flat scales. A keeled scale has a raised center, and I'll show you in a second just kind of what that looks like. But once you do, once you get the head shape and you've got the body, you know, sanded down to the size you want it, or them, you can take and draw each scale on. That's what I do. So you do kind of got to be able to draw a little bit, but most of you guys have some talent drawing, I'm sure. So here you can see, this is all just knife work. I hope you guys can see that. Let me see if I turn this light. So there's just pretty much knife work. And what I've done is, as I've cut these scales in, 
Hmm. As I've cut these scales in, I've come back and cut the, the, the point, the tip of that scale and re removed it with my knife. So the, the inside, the, the point of the scale is deeper than the back of the scale. So it's giving it kind of a raised look. Um, the guys on the links to the websites I'm sending you to, most people use a wood burner to burn in their scales. And it looks great, it really does. It's, uh, you know, you're just burning in each, each and every scale. I don't do that. Um, the main reason is because when you're done, you've got a burnt snake and you have to go back and pretty much paint over the burnt. And because of my spinal cord issue, I've got really shaky hands and it's kind of hard to hold that paintbrush steady and it looks a little sloppy if I try to paint it. Uh, so I tend to use stains, inks, and dyes. You can, um, they make these. I'm sure you've probably seen them. Well, essentially, it's they're stain pens. This is not one, but they're like this, and they come with stain. You can get those, and you can get wood stain, and that allows me to dot each scale the color I want it to be. Um, and you pretty much have to, if you're going to use stains and inks, which inks dry really quick, but stains you want to let them dry. You don't want to. Uh, let each color dry before you go to the next one because you don't want them to bleed over. And I'll show you in a moment, you know, if you, if you do bleed over, how you can correct that. So again, this is all just knife work. Um, but the other side of this, when I've come back and I've used a, uh, my, my rotary tool and kind of shaped each one of these scales, and I'll show you if you can see it, it gives them a, a more realistic look. versus this side, these are all still just kind of flat. So you can take that scale work that you do with a knife and go all the way down the snake with it. Now, these are not deep cuts. Most of my knife work is exacto knife. I need, you need something really fine to get in there and to, to make these cuts. And I'll show you in a second kind of what those, how those cuts work. Um, but you can take, if you've got the time, you can take and do the whole snake in either one of these, these scale types. And it will look awesome. I've done a few, and like I said, they take a long time. The other way you can do it is using, a, if you're gonna do it by hand, you can use different gouges and, and things like that. Um, if you look at these scales on the body, they're not raised, okay? It looks like I've gone in with my gouge, right? and taking out each scale. So what I'm essentially doing is making snake skin instead of snake scales. Uh, my wife took a picture one time of a, a footprint on the beach. And when you look at that footprint, it looks like the, the footprint is raised up out of the sand. And if you don't point out to people that these are actually, um, I guess concave or dug into the, to the wood, their mind will automatically raise these scales when they look at it. Like I, so many times I point this out and they never realize that because when they look at it, your mind tends to invert it. And so it, it, it'll raise the scales because that's what you, you know, your mind sees. But again, you can do each one of these uh, individually with a gouge or using your power tool. Now I suggest that you uh, draw out the pattern, whatever it's going to be. You can see here, I'm kind of drawing, this is going to be a, a timber rattle. And I like to usually do one side or the other first. This one, I'm kind of working my way down. I'm doing the, the darker patterns um, after I do the main part of the body. But so for like, okay, these copperheads look good. Now this one was uh, not naturally twisted. This was a raw. So here you see the, the darker patterns. When I draw these on, I will go and um, outline after I've carved, I carved the, the, the darker part first. 
and then I'll come back and outline. So I, when I do the body, I don't lose my, my darker patterns in with the body. It just kind of helps you keep up with uh, where your pattern is. Oh, if you ever want to do one with a snake like this is hanging off, this essentially this tree grew this way. And this was just where one of the limbs were coming off. You can, you know, you can make that come out as far as you want. I have found people prefer it closer because they feel like sticking out too far, they're going to bump it into things and damage it. Hey, Malcolm, there's a question in the chat. Is there yeah. certain trees that you uh, look for to use? Okay. Certain kind of wood that you look for? In naturally twisted, no. I'll use whatever I can find. I love um, dogwood. Uh, I love American beech is real good. And even red oak, because I can get some really good detail out of those harder woods. But no, any, any, any naturally twisted tree will work. Um, I've never done pine. I take that back. I, I have done pine, but it was a fence post, I think. Um, and then I actually went and bought a couple fence posts from the uh, farm store. And so I've done it. Yeah, you can you can actually carve fence posts. But the, the pine, you know, it's got that resin and it's so it's soft and hard when you're cutting and it, it can be difficult and tricky. Um, for a log, I prefer Leland Cypress, the ornamental trees that people plant in their yard. Uh, if you've ever carved um, a cypress knee, it's real similar. It's, it's soft, it carves really well. Uh, the hard part is, you know, find them anytime. You know, you see them in a lot of people's yards. If I ever see any that's dead, I'll stop and ask them. You know, most times people are glad for you to come cut it down. But the great thing about the Leland Cypress is, So this is a large stick, but it is so lightweight. Um, this is a piece of white oak, okay? This white oak is heavier than this little inside. So a lot of people think, well, I don't want to have to walk around with something this large. And I tell them, I say, well, pick it up. And when they pick it up, they can't get over how light it is. That's another good thing about it. So you can carve a much larger snake on it than you would if, like say, regular hardwood, and it won't be nearly as heavy. Uh, while I've got it on my mind. So naturally twisted trees, they only grow one way. They, they wrap one direction. Um, if you're carving a snake and you really want it to be realistic, snakes tend, tend to not crawl up a branch one way. They, they change directions. So you'll see it in this one, this one. And that's the other good thing about carving from a log is you get to design, you know, kind of how you want it to be. I mean, you can make it crawl up in one direction, but a snake has to change that direction at least one time in order to go up that. Most of them, now there are tree climbing snakes that can go up, you know, your oak snakes and things like that can go straddle a large tree with no problem. Um, I'll show you I can this. So let's see. If you can see what I've got here, these three right in here, you'll notice like the, the corner I was talking about, I take it down. So the back side is higher than this side. Okay. Now if you want to do your knife work, that's really all you got to do. Um, but if you're power carving, once you do that, let me show you. You can take any kind of little flame, right? And then uh, come in here. And you can see where I've, I've, I've shaped that, right? So essentially, if you imagine a piece of clay or dough and you just push your finger down into it, that's kind of the way you want to do these scales if you're going to shape them in the power part. And you can do this too 
even with a gouge, you can come in here. Oh man. So you can come in here and do this with a gouge. Now, these scales, these three here, sorry, this is backwards. I'm not going to try. These three here on the end, right here, those are keel scales. If you can see the, uh, the raised in the middle, that's your venom snakes. And the way you accomplish that is essentially you're going to come in here with the flame, the smaller one, and just do each side of that, right? And that will leave that, that raised kill in the middle. And again, if you want to be realistic, especially on your venomous snakes, and, you know, that's going to be the, the best scale to make. And you can do that uh, with gouges and knives. So Dave Steele, like I said, he's got a tutorial that actually shows you what to do and how to carve a kill scale versus a smooth scale. So your, your venomous snakes, like your uh, rattlesnakes, copperhead and water boxes, they're going to have keel scales. Some of the head plates are not going to be keel scales. Um, your rat snakes, corn snakes, and things like that, those are going to be smooth scales. Um, and a lot of your, your copperheads and your water boxes, so they're going to have more of these square looking head scales, whereas your, your vipers are going to have these pointed looking scales. And so again, if you if you take out that that little bit of wood in the beginning of the scale, you can come back with the flame and really shape that scale and make it look, look a lot more like um, a real snake scale. Now if your power plug you can simply use one of these and do your pattern with. But I like to use multiple uh, different burrs, depending on what I want the scale to look like. Some scales are shaped different than other scales. But I might start with this one and then come back with a small one to give it a little point or something like that or open it up. Um, let's see. So I was talking earlier about your pattern. So like this would be the copper heat, right? And you're gonna to wanna to outline that before you do the body, rest of the body skills so you don't lose it. And so once you're ready to stain, I just use this marker. Once you're ready to, so like on a copperhead, he goes from dark to light to real light. Matter of fact, for the center part here, I usually just leave it natural. Um, William and Cypress works great for a copperhead. That color is just going up, and it kind of has an orange tint to it. Naturally, when you can uh, apply it to the wood. Um, so, but when you're doing the, the darker part of the pattern, and so, like, you bring this, okay. Now let's say this is bled too far, and it doesn't matter what type of pattern you're doing. If your stain bleeds over too far into another scale, once that's dry, what I like to do is this little Dremel tool, I forget now what it's called. But it works great. It doesn't remove a lot of wood. It's not the most powerful. But you can come in here once it's dry and just hit those scales. That have stain on them that you didn't want in them and remove that wood, no problem. That stain, no problem. And you can get really detailed stain work doing that. Uh, now, some people that I've talked to that have done this, they just simply stain it one color. They don't even, you know, try to put a, uh, a real snake pattern in it. And those are beautiful because it's really just stained wood. Who doesn't like stained wood? Uh, but if you're going to do the pattern, 
and you're going to use stain, then you're probably going to want to use that technique when you're working. And you could use your knife to clean, redo that scale also, because with stain, it, you know, it tends to, to blend. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about power farming. Well, let me see if there's anything else I can think of. Now, I'm going to power carbon. So, if you want to try power carbon in your foods, essentially a drill would be all you would have to have. Uh, I have the uh, Fordham, and it's the uh, this XT series, the basic Fordham with a um, hand controlled power adjustment. And it is all you know, you know, I, I know they make some really upgraded versions of that are good. It does everything I need. And if you've ever if you've been using a drill and you wondered whether or not the Fordham was worth it, it is. I took a while to get one, but I don't regret it. Uh, it it's a lot better cut. It's more consistent than a Dremel. A Dremel has actually got a little more vibration in it than you realize. Um, you'll see the difference when you, if you go to a Fordham, even in your scale work. Uh, it's, a, it's a much sharper, detailed cut. And also, it doesn't burn the wood as bad. And I'm not really sure why. Uh, but the great thing about it is if it is burning the wood, because a lot of times these little diamond burrs, like these flame burrs, once they get wore out, they'll tend to want to burn the wood. But with the Fordham, you can adjust that steam. And so you don't necessarily have to go get a new, new burr by the way. Um, to start with, I use a, and like this one here, this one wasn't actually twisted. Um, so with a naturally twisted tree, as I said, a vine is gonna wrap around it and make the wood bulge. If you can see, that discoloration right there. This is where the vine grew. And what you're gonna to wanna to do is, once you get these skin down, you're gonna to have to remove that vine because there's a void in there where it grew. And you can have bugs and different things like that get back in, inside of it and come out later. Uh, but when you do, sometimes that can leave a, a pretty large area where there's no wood. I had mentioned when you cut the ends off of these to the correct length to save them. And what you can do is, if you'll cut those pieces up small enough, you can put them into the to the void where the vine was. Now, to do that, I use JB Well Quick Wood, and it's traditionally been a great product. It, you know, it gets hard, hard as wood. You could uh, drill and tap it, but for some reason here lately, it's not getting as hard as it used to. But you can take and and Cut those uh, end pieces small enough to fill your void and just pack it with that, that wood putty. And then once you've done that, go back and sand it down. And then when you come back and, and carve into it, you're still pretty much carving into, into the wood. Two, it, it's the, it'll be this, it won't be as much discoloration because it's the same type of wood. The, tr the same also is if, like, if you wanted to, uh, like on a naturally twisted one, sometimes you'll find a really nice one, but it won't be long enough. It'll get really thin. There won't be enough for a head. And so you can carve the head separate and attach it using the JB uh, Well Quick Wood. What I do is I hollow out a void in the stick and in the head. And then from the back side of the head and into the snake, and I pack that with that JB Well and you can even come back if you wanted to and put like a, a T nail or something in it to, to, to hold it. But I've never had one come off. And I've tested them. I've, I've beat them, you know, test pieces to see how, how strong they are. And if, you, if you're careful, you won't even be able to tell it. Um, but I have it. Hey, you don't have to do that much. Most of the time, you're going to have enough wood for, for the head. Um, but if you're, if you're, If you're unsure, and that's another thing too, you, you never really know what you're gonna get into on the naturally twist until you've gotten all the bark off of it. There's been some before, 
they they look beautiful when you cut them, but once you take the bark off, there's they're missing chunks of wood. There you're gonna have to patch that somehow. So, but with power carving, whether it's the naturally twisted or the uh, like a Leland Cypress log. What I use is a four inch angle grinder. And you can buy these little, I don't know what you call them, but they're attachments to your, to your angle grinder and these little discs, sandpaper discs with heavy, heavy duty grit. And that's how I remove the bark. Now, if you're using a small tree, a small twisted tree, um, so say like a smaller twisted stick like this one, you're not gonna wanna use uh, your, your angle grinder on the snake. With that, it's best to sand it or use, you know, the, use your knife or something because you'll remove a lot of that real quick. Um, let's see, so once you've, oh, and also what I'm thinking of on the, even cypress trees, once they're dry, that bark just pulls off. It's like a banana, no problem. Another reason I like living cypress. But on your natural twist ones, you're gonna, you're gonna have to use a grinder. Some people um, debark them while they're green, and the bark usually comes off a lot easier that way. But I've been told that if you do that, they split more. And again, if you do have splits, that JD Well wood putty, it does pretty good. Uh, any cracks or checking that you might get in the wood over time. So, but once I've, uh, I've actually, I guess I should show you, well, I don't have one, but if you're carving a, a, a log, let me show you this. Let's say this is a log. And you've drawn out your snake pattern, right? You've got the bark removed, and you, you however you want the snake to be on there, draw, the actual size of the snake onto the stick, and then go back. I don't know if you can see this extra green line, and add like an eighth to a quarter of an inch to the size of it. Because as you're working on this thing, you're going to be constantly bumping that body <clears throat> and putting marks into it, and you don't want that in the finished snake. Once you've gotten the shaft down to where you want it, then you can go in and actually start getting that snake down to the actual size you want. It. But once you've drawn it on there. I've got a uh, Arbor Tech. I'm sure you guys have seen these. And it's a great little tool. Um, and this is what I use to start removing the bulk of the wood. Now, on the naturally twisted ones, you don't need Arbor Tech. Again, the four inch grinder. You can use it as long as you don't you know, take too much off of here. Uh, you can kind of see here the difference in the depth. So like this is where it was when I started. So there's not a lot to take off on. You can see here the change in the difference in the depth. So the red lines using the uh, Arbor Tech, you're gonna come in and cut say every half inch uh, all the way around, but not into your snake. The first, the first cuts you make with your harbor tape will be along the, the outline of your snake. Don't cut um, straight down. You want it to kind of go out. You want the, the bottom of the snake to kind of be wider than the top so that instead of cutting the, the sides of the snake straight up, you want to kind of do them like that. And the reason for that is in the bends of your snakes, it's, it's actually going to be smaller when you start taking the wood down. And what you'll end up with is in, in where the bends are, you'll, it'll be smaller than the rest of the body. And so by adding that angle, it doesn't make it V-shaped. In other words, if you try to go straight up and down, it'll tend to be V-shaped in the twist. And then when you take the top part of it off to, to round it, that rounded area will be smaller than the rounded area where it's not in a, in a, in a twist. So just cut it, cut it like this, and then you can come back in in a moment. I'll show you what you can use to, uh, to really get those edges in there with. 
But using the Arbitec, you go every half inch or so all the way around, and then you can take a screwdriver and just pop those off. If you're using pretty much any uh, pine or Leland Cypress or any evergreen, where there's a limb, well, I don't know if you can see that little knot right there, I wouldn't pop that off <clears throat> because what it does is when it breaks, it breaks deeper than the, the cut from the Arbitec. And once you're pretty close to the thickness of your stick, if you pop that part off with a screwdriver, it's going to gouge into the shaft. Uh, I, I take those back down with the, uh, the grinder. I'll sand those back down, each one of those myself, because <clears throat> the rest of them, they, they'll break off easy, but where the knots are, those, those break deeper. Um, once you've done that, you've done it the first time, it takes off, I think, maybe a quarter of an inch at a time. You go back and do it again uh, and just keep doing that until you get to the, to the, to the size of the, the shaft you want it to be. Uh, a lot of it, though, you won't be able to get into. So in some of these places, once you make that first cut, your arbitrate won't go any deeper. There's just not enough room to work it. And to do that, you can use your power tool, whether it's your Dremel or your Fordham. Uh, so you've got these sanding drums. Uh, those work great for If your Arbor Tech won't get in here, you can come in here with your sanding drums and take it down, shape the sides of it. There are other burrs. This guy here works really well. You come in and really shape the sides up. There, there are these, uh, well, I'm thinking about it. If you go to Harbor Freight, you can get a set with various uh, bits that come into, I think they're like $19. Uh, and I've, I've bought several. <laughs> but that, that's, it's, they're not real expensive. You get a lot of bits for it, and they're, they're good. Um, power carbon bits, actually. So once you've got, and you've taken it down, now as far as rounding out the body of the snake, you can use a wood rasp, a belt sander, uh, palm sanders, I have, for power carbon, it really seems like a process. I have invented a tool, I guess you could say that here. It's a combination of, uh, it's a, it's a knife, electric knife sharpener, and I took the head off of it and used J.B. Weld to attach it to a Dremel. I'm not directly to the Dremel, I'm sure. This part, if you want to make you one of these, I'm telling you, they work great. It's, it, it's, a, uh, it's called a work sharp knife sharpener. And you don't, you can buy it like it is, but it doesn't have enough power for the uh, power problem. So I just essentially tell you well to hook up a drill head attachment screws on and off. And that lets me. The belts, I just use regular uh, belt sanders and I cut them, cut them to fit and super glue them back together. But that allows me to get in, in here and really take that wood down a lot quicker. And even rounding uh, the body of the snake. Uh, now, like I said, I, you know, I kind of do this for a living. Customers, they, they want them as soon as they can get them. So anything I can do to increase the amount of time that it doesn't take to do these is a big help. Uh, so if you make one of those, it's, it's really going to be your favorite to delicious mine. So once you've gotten um, you've gotten your shaft cleaned up, you've shaped the body, you've shaped the head, then you can come in and start cutting your scales. And like I said, for the head, just draw those on. Come back and draw the pattern. The uh, 
Well, if you'll study the snake scale, you'll see that there is actually a pattern, even to the where there's no dark areas. They kind of, they, they run in an angle. So that's pretty much all there is to it. Now, caves are a little different. Um, cane work, I use a much bigger log and I do use lemon cypress. Uh, so like I said, it's a lot lighter and I can do a larger snake. This is not a heavy thing at all. Uh, but essentially it's the same. I start with a, a large log and you know, draw my snake into it. If you have somewhere where there's a limb, you can use that for the handle. This one is you know, one that I uh, carved myself and attached. Uh, as far as attaching it, kind of what I come up with. You see that V-shape? So that V-shape keeps it from being able to be pulled up. And then I come in here with a screw and go into the, so it can't pull out. And then I wood putty all this together just to make sure it all sits and there's no uh, locking of the handle. And it's really strong, it works great. You can't, it can't pull off, you can't pull up. Um, but you have to make those cuts, that V cut, male and female in and just fit them together. But it's the same way. You're gonna, you're gonna take your log and draw your snake off, uh, come in with your arbor tech, make your, 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 your cuts, and then pop them off and keep doing that until you get down to about the size you want. And that's pretty much it. So. Hey Malcolm, there's, uh, there's a couple questions in the chat I was gonna ask you. Um, do you have a vise or something that you said you use to hold uh, the wood when you're doing it? Yes, what I did was, if you've just seen a regular um, saw horses, right? I made a set of wooden saw horses with a two by 12 top on it. And then on each end of it, I've got two arms that come up like this. That kind of hold the stick. I, in other words, I just set the stick in the arms. And then there's a ratchet strap, strap I have attached that comes around the stick and I can crank it down. So it's pulling it tight and down into the arms so it can't move. Um, a lot of people use, I forget the name of it now, some type of, of, of horse. It's, you sit on it and you can apply pressure with your, your feet to hold the stick while you work it. You can use a draw knife too, um, or that's real good if you're going to use a draw knife to remove the bark with. And I'm sure some of you guys know, know what it is I'm trying to describe. I just can't think of the name of it. Can you, um, can you talk a little bit about where you source the sticks? I know there's some that you go find and then there's some that you buy. So, so yes, if you, you know, like I said, I, I tend to hunt for my own sticks. Um, that's part of the fun, being out in nature, hiking, looking. Uh, and I just, you know, my own property, you know, right around here, anybody that own property that allow them. Usually the naturally twisted ones tend to grow um, in swampy areas where it's thick and biny, and you can't find them just about anywhere. Often, if you're just looking going down the side of the road, you can see them. Um, the Leland Cypress were a bunch that I grew, and then like I said, people have them that die, and I find them. But there is a website, I believe it's called Kentucky Walking Sticks, and I'll send that to you. And there you can, he has, I mean, it looks like thousands of naturally twisted sticks that he's cut down. And I've ordered a couple from him where I couldn't find any. And they're already dry. That's the good thing. So you don't have to wait on them to dry. But Kentucky Walking Sticks, uh, I'm going to say they were like $65, somewhere in that area. And you can kind of specify what it is you're wanting. And they'll try to figure it out and see, see what you're looking for. But yeah, other than that, anywhere where it's kind of thick, you know, and, and there's a, a younger stand of trees, a lot of vines, you'll, you'll look, you'll find them. And a lot of them, I find it's like just almost just as many already dead dry rot as I do, you know, green because that vine tends to choke them out. So a lot of people say, well, you're cutting out all these trees. Well, odds are that tree's not going to make it past. You know, about 10 inches at the most, and it's going you know, to the, the vine is going to choke it, or it's going to the vine might be dead, but there's a void in there and it'll break. Um, 
So, and also when you're using found wood like that, you know, like I said, uh, you can't have bug issues, but if you heat treat it, you know, somebody has a heat treating system, that tends to kill them. Uh, as you, once it's dry, usually once it's dry, they, they'll come out. I don't think I've ever had bug issues. Um, I mean, there I've had issues where there were bugs, but once I get to the carbon, they're either gone or dead. But what I do is where I find a bug hole, I tend to uh, spray some bug spray down in it, and, you know, just in case. And once you sand it, you won't be able to tell if you're going to smell or anything. Uh, finishing the stick, the, what I like to use, of course, you know, there's a lot of different things, but I like to use for a finish to protect it from the weather because people like to walk around festivals and things with their, their sticks. And, uh, it's an automobile clear coat. It's called uh, Rust Oil Acrylic Lack of Crystal Clear. It doesn't yellow. That's the one thing to like about it. It won't turn yellow. It stays clear. Um, the way I come about it was a friend of mine wanted me to do a wood burning plaque to go in the flower garden. And I thought, well, it's going to be in direct sunlight. And I figured it was this automobile coat would protect um, the paint job on the car, should it would paint more on the steel or a wood car. And so I, I put a heavy coat of it on there. And I happened to go by his house about a year later, and it still looked like it did the day I gave it to him. It didn't look like it didn't weather at all. So that's what I tend to go with. But, you know, any type of um, varnish or clear coat will work. And I like this all built clear coat because it dries really fast. Do you do any kind of uh, wood treatment before you paint? I know some people use pinacryl on the ends of their sticks uh, to keep them from splitting or to help the splitting. Uh, is there anything yeah. that you use to kind of prep it before you paint it? I used to. I would use like maybe a wax or something to seal it on the ends. But I tend to cut mine so long that they don't they don't split so bad all the way down. It's just on the ends. Um, I don't have a lot of issues. Now, one thing about Leland Cypress, it does tend to check, but not, not too bad. Um, and once it's done checking, it's like done checking. So you don't have to worry about it splitting later on. But you definitely want it to be dry if you've got a, um, a meter that you can use to check the, the how much water is still in it because it will cause them to split. You don't want your work to split. But if it does split, like I said, the JB Weld works, uh, Wood Putty works really well on that, uh, filling them in. You may need to use an ink to match the color because the JB well tends to be lighter than whatever stain you're using. So if you're gonna use like a golden oak on the shaft and you've got, you've used JB well, you might wanna go over that part with uh, early American, something a little bit darker. And we, uh, we talked before the meeting a little bit about your paint process. You said you didn't use paint, it was more stains. Can you talk about the kind of stains you use? Yeah, um, just your basic wood stains from, um, like Home Depot, Men Wax. This is, this was a mid wax, Men Wax. These were the, the marker, stain markers I was telling you about that really helped me because they're much more stable that I can touch to the stick. And so with my hand shaking, I, it's, it's, it's more precise with these. And of course, if you've got extra cans when this runs out, you know, you can just dip them. You don't have to go buy a new one. Um, but yeah, different stains, different, um, you can use leather dyes. Uh, and inks. Uh, this one on my copperheads, it's pretty simple. It's um, golden oak for the body, um, red oak for the main part here. Then it goes to an early American and then a natural. And of course, you're going to use like a black uh, paint pen around the edge. Now the white is usually, these small white lines around the black are usually uh, a white paint marker. Um, and then on the head, a, um, this is gun stock, kind of give that head that copper orange look. And this regular white stain on the bottom. And how about the eyes? Do you use something specific for the eyes or? Um... So how do you accomplish that? Oh, we'll about the eyes. So some of my eyes I carve. 
Some of them are inserts. So like this one here, for example, I kind of started at nine, it's just carved. And on this one, what I've got is like a, uh, just a little piece of copper tubing. Um, my Stanette uses a, uh, um, a bullet case. You just kind of press in and then you come back and work it with either your knife or your power tool, whichever you want, kind of get that rounded. You, there, there are um, power carbon bits for like eye cutters. Those work, work well. Um, I like to, when I can, if I can get the, the taxidermy eyes, I like to use the taxidermy eyes. But also, if you don't want to spend that much money, because they do get expensive, you can get like at um, Hobby Lobby, go to the beads, the, the, the jewelry section. And these are just, most of these are just beads. And you can, you, you drill your hole to the size it needs to be. And then you can use the JB Well wood putty to press your, your bead in and to set it. And then once it dries, go back and, and remove, you know, any excess you have. That works really good. So you can carve them or you can buy beads or the taxidermy eyes, either one. And as far as the handles go, do you um, use a specific wood for the handles or do you try to use something from the same tree or how do you do that? So it's up to you. Like I said, um, if you can find where a branch is growing, on the, the tree and use that for the handle. That's really good. But most of mine now, I use, I like to use exotic woods. Like this is purple heartwood. Um, I think that's all I got. Yeah, these are different. I think this was a, I can't recall what it is now, but we have a, um, a wood, exotic wood store not far from here. And I'll go by there and buy, you know, different blocks and I cut them out on my bandsaw and, uh, Sand them down and, and, and shape them up how I want them. All right. Um, do we have any other questions in the uh, in the group for uh, Malcolm as far as his sticks go? Uh, Malcolm, where can they find your work? And if somebody's interested in commissioning you uh, to do a stick for them, uh, is there a specific process you go through for that? Yeah, um, I don't have anything for sale right now because all of these are, I've, I'm holding on to these for a couple of art shows and festivals I got coming up. Uh, but once I'm done with those, anything I've got left over after these next two shows, I will put those on my website um, for sale. So you can, you can, if there's anything on there for sale, and usually it's toward the end of the year when I, when I put things on there, you can order directly off the website. But if you'll go to Instagram or Facebook, you can contact me there. Uh, just send me a message. Uh, if for some reason, I don't get it, resend it. Sometimes it tends to put it in a, like a spam section for some reason. But uh, yeah, my contact info is on my website. Or you can just message me through uh, Instagram or Facebook. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, uh, Malcolm, I just want to say thank you for coming on today and sharing your information. Thanks for uh, talking us through uh, the Cure Heath Twisted Sticks. Uh, if you're interested, go out and check out his website. There's quite a bit of information out there. Uh, he's got quite a few examples out on Instagram that I've looked at and some videos and stuff out there. Uh, if you're interested in checking out those, make sure you go look at that and contact him if, uh, if there's something specific you're looking for. I uh, want to remind you all, we're going to start back on September the 3rd with our weekly meetings. Uh, go through the, uh, the lineup real quick as far as what we've got lined up. Uh, on September the 3rd, we're going to have Daniel Clay on. Uh, Daniel just had a new book released on uh, chip carving. He's been on with us before in the past, but he's got a book he's going to talk about. Uh, so we'll have him on on September the 3rd. On September the 10th, Jack Loring uh, it's going to be on, he's a uh, cousin Jack carves on YouTube. If anybody's seen that, he'll be on with us on the 10th and he's going to do a little demonstration for us. Uh, right now we don't have anybody scheduled for the 17th. We're going to be preparing to travel out uh, to Colorado on September the 24th and 25th. Uh, don't forget that they're going to be doing the carving the Rockies show. Uh, it's the first annual CCA show in Colorado. Uh, I'll be out there broadcasting live from that show 
uh, on that Saturday, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But if you're not able to go to the show, make sure you join us here uh, at 3 p.m. Again, it'll be Eastern Standard Time, although um, they're in a different time zone there. We're still going to try to keep the time the same. Uh, on October the 1st, uh, Chris Gardia is going to be on with us, talking to us a little bit more about scouting and bolo ties and the history of that, uh, and take us through some of the carving of uh, bolo ties. Uh, October the 15th, Nikki Reese, who's also been on with us in the past, uh, she does the Little Gnomes. Uh, she's agreed to come on and do a painting demo, and that's uh, something we haven't had for a while. So uh, join us uh, if you want to see Nikki's uh, painting demo on October the 15th. Again, Bob Hershey, who's on with us today, is going to be doing uh, a meeting on the 22nd. I think he's going to be working in Cottonwood Bark that day. Uh, so, again, that's October 22nd. And then October the 29th, Rod Gatlin uh, is going to be coming on. He's going to talk a little bit about the Charlotte Woodcarver Show uh, down in Charlotte, North Carolina. And, again, that show's not until April of next year, but he's going to talk about that and his woodcarving journey. Uh, so we've got quite the lineup uh, through October. We're going to be booking people for November and December. Again, we're going to try to do a weekly meeting through the end of the year. Uh, so every chance you get, make sure you join us here at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, Malcolm, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you all for taking time out of your summer to uh, come in and meet with us. And we'll see you all on September the 3rd with the International Association of Woodcarvers. Thank you all.